Okay. So, so a lot of these people that are going to be coming on because we are recording, they're going to basically accept the recording part of it. We have some people out there already that have come aboard and uh, obviously we're going to wait maybe five minutes beyond the two o'clock point. And uh, let's see if uh, some people are shy. They're not going to show their face. Some people are not shy. They're welcome to come aboard. And uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, my name is Cisco Manessas. I'm the uh, founder of the National Firescape Association. And Lance, who are you? Lance Luke, I'm a building consultant, construction engineer located in Honolulu, Hawaii. There you go. I can only afford a palm tree, but uh, you can afford to live there, which is great. Yeah, I <laughs> so have let's two see. palm trees. We... <laughs> you got two palm trees. Yeah. I have to rent this one. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. So um, with that, I do have some people that I see out there. I got an Arnold. I got an Earl. I got Coconut uh, Co coconut Waikiki, Janet Lee. So if anybody wants to chat a little bit before we get going on this. Uh, and Cisco, you want to rep reposition? Because yeah. as I look at Lance, you want to put it on this side? So maybe the camera's better on that side. Um, so Lance, uh, or anybody, if anybody has a question, just to start this off before we get into our actual seminar. Um, let me know if you have a question. Otherwise, uh, Lance, you and I are, are the ones that are going to be talking to each other, asking each other questions. And uh, let's see where this where this all goes. So, Lance, uh, you've been in the business how long? Too long. Too long, yeah? Yeah. For, uh, 43 years. 43 years. Yeah. Well, even though I'm younger than you, Lance, I actually have been in this business over 50 years. My dad hijacked me as a pirate uh, when I worked for the family business, which I believe you did too in some of the conversations you and I have had. Mm -hmm. um, but my dad grabbed me at 12. And um, so that puts me in the 50-year uh, mark um, in dealing with, uh, you know, the egress systems out there nationwide. I'm out of Boston, even though I borrowed a palm tree. Um, but we work nationwide. We have an office throughout, throughout the country. We have an office in San Francisco and uh, Treasure Island. And, um, and we've been dealing nationwide uh, with nothing but firescapes and balconies. Uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about, uh, Lance, is going to be how um, California had a similar incident in 2019, uh, actually 2017, and there was a collapse of a balcony with students on it, and a lot of them foreign students from uh, primarily Ireland, and they actually fell, and seven died instantly that day. There must have been about 20 or 25 people on this balcony, and the whole balcony gave way. And um, and because of that, they changed the law that went into effect 2019. And now every six years in all of California, every balcony and railing must be examined by law um, under the code SB 721. We'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. But um, that's where we're at. We have some people here. If anybody has any comments or questions that they'd like to, to get, uh, we have several people coming aboard. Uh, but uh, Martin, uh, we spoke briefly. I think he's uh, from another hotel also. Um, so we have hotel people here. We have city officials that should be coming aboard. We've invited fire prevention. We've invited the building department. Uh, and what we're going to do is take an incident that occurred to one hotel and say, is this possibly happening in your hotel? And um, you've been, uh, you went to the to the hotel, correct, uh, Lance? The day, yeah, it, the day it occurred or mm -hmm. the day after? No, the one one hour after the the incident. Wow. Who called you? Was it the hotel or was it uh, news news people? No, it was the news people. Yeah, they know right away. They <clears> monitor <throat> they monitor anything that's bad news. In fact, <clears throat> I was out at the at the scene before them. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know you live uh to the east of that. Well, I was Beautiful already hotel. In, I was already in Waikiki at the time. Oh. Yeah, I was I was a judge for a, a Department of Education uh, contest that they had. Gotcha. Well, <clears throat> the main uh, the main thing that we're going to be talking about is um, how you and I, with our fifty years of experience, um, we see things that um, is really the life cycle of cement the life cycle of iron and how the two don't like each other and <laughs> never have, 
never will. You know what I'm saying? And as we get into spalling, we're going to talk about how today uh, rebar is now coded to, to, to basically stop what has occurred in old rebar uh, in old cement um, when it comes to, uh, <clears throat> to what we are seeing today. Um, and so a lot of these were untreated, uncoated rebar. A lot of this is untreated, uncoated iron that somehow marries the two together. And whether we like it or not, a lot of people are going to learn today that a quarter inch of brand new steel, you give it 25 to 55 years and you sprinkle normal uh, weather patterns to it, it'll have, it'll grow at a, at a, an ex, a standard rate, but you add water to it, concentrated water to it, you are now exponentially going to make a quarter inch of steel will grow to one inch of rust. And by the time a quarter inch of new steel becomes one inch of rust, there's nothing structural left about it. Right, Lance? You know, yep, that's right. Rust has no structural value. It'll shear. It'll, it'll, It'll be a catastrophic event. And that's going to be one of our categories today. It's just, this was a catastrophic event and there's more to come. Uh, and that's what our belief is that, you know, we have to warn people to say, hey, um, you know, the condos, the hotels, the building owners who may own one apartment building that has these egresses, mm -hmm. uh, these balconies, this this iron and cement mix, Um Today, they're doing the right thing about it. But uh, in the past, they just married the two together and there was cats and dogs. Right, Lance? Yeah, that's right. So let's take a look, see what time it is. It's 2.04, almost 2.05. Uh, anybody have a question for us before we get started? Because about a minute from now, we'll just get going. And uh, we've got a good uh, crowd here and uh, people will just uh, ask questions. It is open. So please don't just let us talk because it'll be me and Lance. <clears throat> what I want you to do is, you know, raise your hand or just ask a question. We'll pause the seminar uh, and we'll answer the question because your question may answer everybody's concerns. <clears throat> and so there should be no question that you guys can ask us that we haven't answered in the past. Okay. So, um, so Lance, as they say, that as it ticks, tick tocks and counts down, um, what what do you'd like to say? Because you you were, you and I had a conversation uh, in regards to just your your history with the mental attitude of all the people who own buildings, condos, and hotels. Is maintenance uh, on the forefront? Is that what you've seen in your history of forty years? Do you see people? that are just sort of in a pro maintenance uh, attitude, or you see everybody is sort of in the, you know what, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality, which is the rest of the U S if it ain't broke, don't fix yeah. it. That's the similar. Is. Yeah. That's similar how it is in Hawaii. Some buildings that uh, I go to, they, they don't even have a maintenance program and some, they have an elaborate, like a high-rise building in uh, downtown Honolulu, it, it was a it's a condo hotel. They have a three-ring binder, big binder with their maintenance manual and all the procedures. And uh, when I asked for it, they hardly could find it, and it was collecting dust. No one opened it up to look at it. So, although they have a maintenance program in place, they have to follow it. So. Proactive is is a key. We're always about safety, health and safety of buildings. So, oh, I see the uh, nice PowerPoint. Well, for those of us that are Mac people, PowerPoint and Keynote, Keynote is an Apple product. And Keynote is the Spielberg version of po the presentation, PowerPoint, you know, PowerPoint. So hopefully you'll like it. It comes, uh, it's going to have some bells and whistles. So, so let's you and I speak, Lance. This is the start of the seminar. And Great. um, and and what do we have? <clears throat> we have a, a situation that occurred. Um, I don't believe this was isolated. I think this is just the beginning. This is the canary in the coal mine, not only for this hotel, but for every hotel out there that is of, of, uh, of age, 
this this hotel, this wing got built 55 years ago. So here's our concerns. We're gonna we're gonna get into more details. And uh, this is what fell from the sky, and it landed, um, you know, between sunbathers. And this is the luckiest thing that ever happened in Hawaii happened a few days ago. And that is that huge slab of concrete fell in between all these people that were sunbathing as identified by these, these towels. These towels represent humans who were all there sunbathing. And then this incident occurred. Okay. So we're going to talk about procedures on inspecting procedures on load testing maintenance programs between you and I, we're going to, we're going to kick out some great ideas here. Okay. So right. again, I encourage anyone and everyone that has a question as we proceed, please unmute yourself, ask the question, and then we'll proceed with the seminar. We've got two hours to really explain in detail and answer any and all your questions. Okay. So <clears throat> what's the agenda today? So we're going to try to talk about this catastrophic event and we're going to do a news recap in case you missed the news stories. It was all over the news in Hawaii. We're going to play a few of these. And so that everybody can get back up to speed on just exactly what occurred a few days ago. Okay. Uh, no loss of life, no liability, right? Or as we say here, was the liability, I don't know if any of these on the right here, uh, was there any liability? Um, so what occurs here is that somebody who almost died at your place is going to, you're going to have liability right there. These people. Now, I'm an expert witness. Lance, you're an expert witness. You've been in places where people are injured, they collect money. And where people are dead, they collect money. And when people almost get hurt, they collect money. So uh, there's no loss of life, but no liability. But yep, there's there's some leftover hand grenades or, or um, what do you call it, future possibilities of events happening because this building is 55 years old. Okay. Uh, credentials and of our expert witness. I'm going to speak about me. Lance is going to speak about himself. What's the main causes of the event? Me and Lance are going to throw ideas out of what, if we got pulled in to this, to this case, what would we say? What could have happened? So you'll, you'll see two experts discussing spalling and rusty iron. Okay. Uh, so we're going to also review the spalling life cycle. How many years does it take for something to happen when everything is normal and what's going to happen when something is abnormal? How does that accelerate the life cycle of a piece of steel? Okay. And the spalling of a piece of cement that is together, but only to have the steel tear it apart. Uh, how right now at the end of all this, what we're going to tell you is what choices do you have today? Are you going to just maintain because you're not so bad? Are you going to reinforce because there were some issues and you have to reinforce, reinforce the system immediately? Um, or are you you you're scheduled to replace? You have no choice. You have to replace. Okay, uh, and then at the end of this, for a little bit of time, we're only going to discuss additional egress concerns that you should be addressing that you may not understand. You need to address. Some of you have, aside from this tower, and Moana has this, they have fire escapes on the older part of the building that nobody's touching. So let's talk about those. Okay. <clears throat> Let's start off, everybody, by watching the news piece. Scary moments when a railing fell from a balcony at the Moana Surfrider. It came crashing down onto the beach below. Scary Sorry moments when a railing fell from a balcony at the Moana Surfrider. It came crashing down onto the beach below. Emergency personnel say two people had Lance, minor injuries from falling debris, but both refused to go to the okay. hospital. Bryce Moore joins us live from Waikiki. Bryce, what can you tell us? Good evening to you both. And yes, you can see behind me that officials quickly cordoned off the area where the railing came crashing down to. Now I'm gonna take a step aside so you can take a look at the room where it indeed fell from. And I actually spoke to the hotel guest whose room it fell from. Now he didn't wanna go on camera, but he shared with us that he was there when it happened. And both he and nearby bystanders are all extremely thankful that the situation didn't end much worse. Walking into the room, just bringing some luggage from my son and daughter-in-law who just got here. Uh, the room wouldn't be ready till 3 o'clock, so we were putting it in there. As we opened the door, we heard a loud crash, and my daughter-in-law and wife went through, 
They saw it. Have you ever watched like when they implode hotels in Vegas? That's what it sounded like to me. It was a crash like I've never heard before. I'm like, I'm thinking, how is that coming out of my room? I saw where it landed and I thought, thank God, I mean, because two feet either way, it would have probably killed somebody, as heavy as it is. All, all the chairs were set up. Everyone was there. <laughs> were there people in chairs? Yeah, yeah, there's people there uh, underneath, it looked like, yeah. Now, emergency medical services did say that two people were hit by falling debris down below, but the injuries were minor and no one was transported to the hospital. Now, the Moana surf rider, we did reach out to them and they confirmed the incident happened and they said that a statement will be forthcoming, which we'll bring to you as soon as it comes in. As far as the hotel guest, he's been moved to a room on the 11th floor and he tells me he's happy, but he won't be going out on his balcony anytime soon. For now, I'm Bryce Moore reporting to you live from Waikiki, KHO 2 News, working for Hawaii. Back to you, too. So, Lance, uh, this this last statement that he had from the um, from the person who got to go to the 11th floor, and that guy is already questioning whether or not all the railings, and it's not just the iron, Lance. What fell was a huge slab of cement that had a small piece of railing on top of it. So the railing was actually... Uh, a one-piece uh, uh, cement attachment that makes the rail. It's a cement railing with a iron on, on top. Isn't that correct? Yeah, we call that a, <clears throat> a concrete railing wall because most of the railing was a concrete wall. And then you have a little section of metal railing on the top. Ironically, he got moved to the 11th floor, which is a floor exactly like the same setup with that. Uh, concrete <laughs> railing wall. Well, he's already doing something. He's saying, I'm not going near that railing because so he's already questioning the the integrity of the, the whole building, which is 55 years old. So let's move on to another one. This is another great piece here. Moments in Waikiki this afternoon after railing falls from a hotel room balcony narrowly missing beach goers below. At least two people were treated for injuries. Our Jolani Martinez joins us live near the Moana Surf Rider where it happened. Jolani. Mark Ash, the metal railing that fell earlier this afternoon from around the fifth floor of the Moana Surfrider Hotel is still out here. It's been blocked off. I have my photog show you. It's been blocked off with a fence, yellow tape, and lounge chairs. You can also see that it fell where umbrellas and chairs are set up for guests to rent. Fire crews say the railing didn't hit anyone directly. EMS said two people refused to be transported to the hospital. HFD says one one person was being treated by ocean safety when they arrived. Another person suffered a minor injury while escaping the falling railing. Right now, it's unclear what caused the railing to give way, but we spoke with one of the guests booked for that room. He did not want his face shown, but told us it all happened as he and his family walked into the room to drop off some bags. Open the door and we heard a loud crash. And my daughter-in-law and wife went through. They saw it. They saw the railing in the section going over. I was the fourth one through the door. But as we went through, it was like kind of surreal. I mean, you don't expect to see that. Um, again, 5.30 this morning, I was on that railing, on my phone talking. Those who are on the beach say there were people lounging below. All of a sudden, it sounded like they were doing some kind of like demolition construction so loud, I can't even describe it. Um, and then I look up and it seemed like it was happening in slow motion, honestly, like falling very slowly. And there was a woman directly under. So we were all screaming, move, move. And um, it, like I said, just looked like it was happening in slow motion. She luckily got out of the way and no one was injured to um, my knowledge, but it was really a crazy situation. Again, staff have blocked off the area, but you can see that brown pole hanging. It looks like it was from the top of the railing and ripped off. And you can also see the fallen piece clipped the railing below. We've reached out to the Moana Surf Rider Hotel for comment and are waiting to hear back. Reporting live from Waikiki, Jelani Martinez, Hawaii News Now. So, uh, Lance, what we're going to be talking about is that this, this railing actually fell down to a walkway down below. As you can see, uh, in in once we do the the next video, the uh, and they basically it rolled off the top of there and rolled down and fell into the uh, below. There was such enough force, and we'll show that that this thing didn't just fall into the sand. It actually fell down below and then rolled forward and then fell down again into these the sand mix. 
right? Is that uh, what you and yeah, I have that's, seen? Yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna basically show that this actually the fall was reduced because uh, the it fell from the fifth down to a walkway and then fell one story further down to the sand. So it, they, the 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 uh, velocity was reduced greatly by it hitting uh, the piece below, but it needed to go somewhere. It was either going to bounce or it was going to roll, and it rolled off that lower section. We'll show that in a second. Let's talk about this next video of uh, the final piece here of the of the piece. So it did hit all the major news page, the news uh, uh, this morning, stations. This morning, investigators are looking into why a hotel balcony railing collapsed and fell onto Waikiki Beach. Take a look at this. The railing missing from a fifth floor hotel room at the Moana Surf Rider. It fell Tuesday afternoon onto the beach below, sending beachgoers running. The Honolulu Fire Department says no one was directly impacted, although one person suffered a minor injury while getting out of the way from the falling railing. HFD also says when firefighters arrived, Ocean Safety was treating another person who was then transferred to paramedics. Here's what one witness had to say. I was on the beach by Dukes and I heard some loud shouting and I turned and saw the balcony falling. First it was that slab and then the, um, the railing and it just fell on top of um, where people were laying on lounge chairs. Luckily nobody got hurt or killed. So those people were okay. But it was quite startling. In a statement to Island News, the hotel said, quote, we are looking into an incident that occurred involving a balcony in our tower wing. We take this matter very seriously. The safety and security of our guests and employees is our top priority. So, <clears throat> as they say, thank God a lot, of, a lot of people yelled. Thank God a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, assisted in, uh, but it was, it was one of these, it could have been a lot worse, but it was a catastrophic event that occurred. Um, it, uh, it was, it was 55 years in the making. Um, and, uh, let's get to, uh, who we are in, uh, in, in this, in order for us to say such things, you know, people are going to question, uh, who we are. Uh, first of all, I'm the founder of the National Firescape Association. Uh, my dad, uh, who's 86, just recently got out of the business, but I learned quite a bit from my dad. And then I took it to the next level. I'm an expert witness on a lot of firescape uh, cases where the injury is to the tenant, uh, the injury is to the fireman, and again, uh, there's injuries and there's also deaths that I've been involved, and I've brought in over $150 million nationwide on events where firescapes were uh, let go for 25, 50, 75 years, and thank God we have a life cycle of rust because it, it speaks for itself. Spalling has a life cycle that Lance will talk about, and um, and so I take I take this uh, nationwide. So I have taught from Seattle to San Diego, Chicago to Texas, and from Maine to Florida, and it's all continuing ed education classes. So these firefighters, these building inspectors, they all need uh, credits of anywhere from three hours to six hours. I teach both. If any of you ever want to see my typical class, go on to YouTube and just type in Fire Escape Seminar, and you'll see that I'm the only one doing seminars in the nation. I'm the only one doing Fire Escape Seminars, uh, and that's because it's the bastard child of egress. Not everybody cares about it, and um, and just so you know, it's not a big, heavy topic uh, for the fire prevention in Honolulu, because unless an incident occurs, nobody's going to talk about it. So uh, everybody uh, be aware that, you know, uh, this this is coming and I'm going to be speaking to you about how uh, balcony rails are going to be coming up. But Lance, it's your turn. What, who, what makes you an expert besides age? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm older than you, but don't push it. Don't anyway, push it, no. uh, before before I, uh, I start that, I just want to express my appreciation uh, as well as uh, with uh, Cisco for uh, all the people attending and those are who, who are going to be uh, watching later. This is a very important subject. Uh, I've been a construction uh, guy for about 43 years now. Uh, I wrote a couple of books. I always give webinars. I speak throughout the country on mainly building and construction topics. And uh, as Cisco mentioned, I'm also an expert witness, uh, mainly on construction uh, litigation cases, but also uh, some personal injury that involve uh, building failures. So we're happy to be here today to 
uh, let you guys know we ha we have important information to share regarding building safety. So I'm I'm glad I got invited to speak. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's continue on. What do we have? Uh, we have the Moana. The building we're talking about is to the left, but uh, above and beyond the railings and the balcony issues that they have, they also have a fire escape system here um, facing the ocean, okay? And so if, uh, this is the oldest hotel, 1901. It was the center portion, and they started building additions. And so 1901, 1952, I believe this east wing was added. And then in 1969, which I'm going to show you, that's when that west wing after the Sheraton bought out these people. So beautiful hotel. I I know this hotel. I stayed in this hotel in the west, I mean, in the east wing. Love the hotel. And it, it kind of, this is one of the reasons uh, that I want to do this activity right now, this thing about uh, balconies and fire escapes, um, is because uh, like many of you, you have an older building that not only do you have railings and balconies, but you also have fire escapes or cement stair egress systems that are external to the building. So they also have, as you can see here, not only that beautiful tower that they built in 1969, but they have these fire escape systems. So everything you see here on the left and everything you see down there on the right, those are those don't belong to tenants. This is how people would get out and get some fresh air in case the building's on fire. And there's an internal staircase inside both of these. And a lot of times these internal staircases are metal, still exposed to the weather, and it's a 50-50. They're not enclosed so that you you know the smoke gets trapped. They're open to the outside so that if there is any smoke that's in that fire tower, um, the tenants, they can get out. But as you can also see here to the left, those waiting balconies over there, which is made, it's called the area of refuge where you would go waiting for firemen to save you, or that's where you would go to take a breath because there's too much smoke in the building. So 1901 building, 1952 building, and then a 1969 building is the big tower on the West. Okay. So, <clears throat> hey, uh, Lance, let's get into this. But uh, Lance, before we get going, let's see if anybody has a question. Anybody have a question out there? Lance, silence tells us that you and I need to continue talking. Lance. Well, I do um, have a question as... here. I do apologize, Cisco. Yes. Uh, from the audience. Uh, they want to know how old were these balconies that collapsed? Okay, that's a great question. We're going to be talking about that in a little bit. This is a 55-year-old building built in 1969. This, this, These railings and these cement with railings, these are panels. What do you call them, Lance? Uh, precast uh, concrete panels. Perfect. So these precast concrete panels, they basically are held with by these inserts. So if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, these precast panels would have the iron installed inside the precast first, maybe an angle inside the precast or a straight piece of flat material, maybe half inch thick. Would you agree or? Yeah, I would probably. I'd have to actually see the the actual plans, uh, which I'm I'm trying to get a hold of, so I can really study this uh, even more. Perfect. So, but basically, as you can see, the panel and the railing, like this other side here, was lifted by a crane as a one piece, brought and then and then basically injected into these areas here, 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 and here, and here. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six pieces of metal that were basically injected into the floors of these. Okay, is that do you agree with that? Yeah, what it looks like is uh, the the metal pieces that you're talking about are concrete anchors that connect the uh, wall, the side wall or the railing to the actual lanai slab. And it looks right. like, uh, in addition to the poured in place lanai slab, there's about a one inch topping over that that probably covered yeah, up. Yeah, I got a better anchors. picture. I'm going to get closer. 
But just so that everybody understands, what me and Lance have been talking about is that there's definitely corrosion happening over 55 years. There's a there's the, there's definitely corrosion here to the extreme right, but my God, there's extreme corrosion here to the to the left, and it is my belief that the water that would come from normal rain would basically trap inside uh, this because these these uh, cast in place panels they, they don't rest on the floors; they basically are attached. And they create a 90 over here in this corner, right? And whatever water needs to come in here, and it could be substantial torrential rain, it got to go somewhere. And I got closer pictures, but I believe there was a, a separation or, or water was coming in here much more than over here to the extreme right. So that's our that's my basis to start with. You agree with that, Lance, that we definitely have water intrusion more to the left than more to the right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. But for sure, for sure, 55, 55 years, it it didn't leave this one to the extreme right alone. It's hitting that one just under natural, just under natural, right? Uh, 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 you know, elements of rain and, and the sweat of cement, the rebar doing its job and the metal that's embedded in one piece of uh, cement sticking into another piece of cement. They never like each other. And because it was 55 years ago, Lance, do you think these are galvanized embedded pieces? Yeah, most likely. But even if it was not non-galvanized, even if it was stainless steel, uh, there still could be a, an issue because of, like you said, the water, this, uh, you know, humidity, other factors that cause uh, of course. metal, natural, metal to corrode. The natural life cycle of steel embedded in any cement. Yeah, I, and the location. I'm going to contradict with you i believe these were not galvanized uh because you get to see uh galvanized happening more in the 70s in the 80s you know what i'm saying that's when you start uh um galvanized became a norm otherwise what i've seen in my li lifetime of dealing with firescapes is that it was not until the late 80s or 90s that galvanized became written in architectural plans that whatever steel is going to go there, especially in front of, of the ocean, I want galvanized to be the base. And that's not the case in Hawaii. Some of the iron that I've seen, any iron that I've seen when I visited Hawaii twice uh, in my lifetime, I've been there for two weeks at a time. And I went around, I saw that anything iron was in a deplorable condition because it wasn't galvanized. Uh, because galvanization would have to happen most likely off island and then brought in and shipped. And so that extra cost a lot of times just keeps things in raw steel. Okay. So let's get right. closer. Let's see what we have here. Um, this is the, uh, what you and I have in, indicated that uh, it is in there. And like you said, it already separated. You're telling me that there's two pieces of cement here. There's the cement from uh, the pour. And then there's, well, there, you think there's a second pour before they put in the tile? Is that what you're yeah, telling me? It looks like a, a topping, uh, slab over the original uh port in place lanai slab and then uh tile over that the, the problem with conducive spalling conditions is water is penetrating through uh, could be the uh, grout in the tile or any kind of unsealed areas you could have a crack uh, somewhere water's going in and the, the water is not fresh water even if it was fresh water clean no chemicals it still could cause corrosion but uh, the problem gets exacerbated because the water is salt water rain water a uh, heavy corrosive environment because this hotel is is right on the beach basically so you have the trade winds that blow a lot of salt there's chlorides and everything so that's a major contributing factor to uh, spot and repair and corrosion on any kind of metal. It doesn't matter what kind of metal it is, steel, iron, stainless steel, galvanized, whatever. It doesn't matter. I've seen all types uh, corrode. Right. And so with this blow up picture that I'm looking at on the top right hand corner, and again, I'm a rust guy because I have to deal with fire escapes and how they rust, rust two pieces of metal and separate I also see rust that separates cement, and it's pretty uniform. Right now, to the extreme left, I have a half inch to three quarter uh, uh, wedge, but to the extreme right, I have only about a, a three eighths to half inch wedge. 
So if to the extreme right, the extreme left is three quarters to one inch of, of opening, and to the extreme right is only three eighths to half uh, to half inch of opening, it's an indicator that it, there is two pieces of cement here, and a lot of times they don't marry. And what you need is anything that wedges it, and it and it's so the 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 rust growth, whereas a, a quarter inch of a quarter inch of new steel will become one inch of rust, is pretty evident on the right side of your photograph, and. Um, What's that called when iron just starts, you know, uh, uh, layering the the layers of rust? What's that uh, called, Lance? Well, uh, that's uh, um, oxidation and yep. uh, just co corrosion in general. And just so that the viewers uh, know that when you have a piece of rebar and it starts corroding, it could corrode and expand up to seven times the actual size of the rebar. So a quarter uh, inch then, of rust becomes one inch. I mean, a quarter inch of steel becomes one inch of rust. And that's what I see there, layered rust. I don't see much more steel there. And a lot of times what we would see, you and you can correct me, I would see some, some silver. If there was a shearing of any kind, I'm not looking at any shearing right now indicating that something was still holding on. This was, this was being held by a, by a, by a hair, right? Yeah, we're not we're not seeing any any really silver observable pieces of of metal at all. It, it's, yeah, sh a know, shear it, action happening. Well, part of it is gone, and the other part is corroded. So, Correct. I mean, if we took apart a little section of the top layer, I'm sure we could find you know more rust. But remember that you know this is supposed to be a three to four inch slab. And it has reinforcing bars in it. So if we say we took the top layer off yep. and looked, we're going to see uh, basically uh, grids that look like um, basically squares where the rebar is tied together. And I'm pretty sure the condition of the rebar is, is corroded. So listen, Lance, on this underneath here where my arrows, can you see my arrows, yeah. my, my cursor? Right. See all this bubbling here? That's an indication that this is a corner that was getting so much water, it actually permeated through the cement slab, which I believe is a six inch slab. That's the norm, isn't it? For that slab to be six inches. Uh, and then that top slab is in an inch and a half, maybe two at the most, including the, including the tile. I've got indications that water has made it into this corner because the, the water is not being channeled away enough. So whenever there's a huge amount of rain, it, it sits in that corner, permeates as best it can before it evaporates, or maybe there was another way to get this water out of here, but I'm not seeing it, but I'm seeing an indication in this corner that water permeated through the entire six inch slab. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So let's say we um, remove a section of that corner, that, that top section. We're going to see corroded rebar because if you look at the bubbling paint, what's happening is the water on the top of the lanai is, like you said, seeping through and the concrete has rebar in it. So the rebar is getting corroded and I'm pretty sure it's causing spalling. Expansion. And, and we can't we can't really see it, but uh, I guess more investigation when you start uh, taking sections apart, doing destructive testing and documenting it. I'm sure they're going to note yep. concrete spalling, cracking, corroded rebar. And that kind so of for our people listening, they're going to say, listen, when you look at cement and it has these kind of bubbles underneath, you are being given a sign that there's things going on from above because the whatever membrane you have above is not holding uh, or is, is letting water permeate in that corner. The rebars are the first thing that's going to show down below with rusty stains and or paint bubbling because as the as the rebar expands, it opens up a little water trickle area. And then basically, if it can get through in its, in its entirety as just water, it has no choice but not to push the paint along. And that's a bubbling paint as an indicator that there was a, a huge amount of water concentration in that corner every rainstorm, correct? Yeah, I want to add too that norm in the norm normal course of construction, when you first build the uh, lanai concrete slab, okay, before you put anything on it, you waterproof it. So there should be a layer of waterproofing, and I'm not sure, yeah. you yeah. know, how 
uh, what kind of system they use, whether it was a three part, five part, or whatever. But yeah, uh, if, and, and here's if an exposed fact, rebar for you, Lance, right yeah, there. Well, I have exposed rebar right there. That's the first spall. She already blew out this corner, and that's the rebar right there. That's brown. You know what I'm saying? If this was fresh today, it would have fresh looking concrete and uh, and it would have fresh looking rebar. But right now, aside from the inserts growing to one inch, the rebar already spalled. You know what I'm saying? And there's there's plenty of water getting here because I'm getting front spalling happening. And that's all from rebar. That's not even from the inserts. Well, that's and it gets scary. better to the right. That's but, the know. scary part of it, because we're only looking at one one balcony here. And this yeah, hotel has numerous balconies. Yeah, yeah. As I say, you and I agree, this is not an isolated inc incident. This is a canary in the coal mine, not only for the hotel itself, but for all hotels near the ocean that are, you know, 25 to 75 years old or greater. But this is one of the oldest hotels. But at the same time, everybody, if you're 25 to 50 years old, uh, and you don't have a maintenance program of any kind, this is already happening at your hotel. That's the life cycle of spalling. And Lance, you're going to go into deep in, deeper on this. Yeah, so Lance, I, let's talk. Well, let me let me tag on to what you said. You mentioned hotels, but we have to add in not only hotels, but any type of building, whether it's a condominium, whether it's an office building, any apartment building, any type of building that has railings in it, that you're, the building doesn't have to be near the ocean it could be miles away correct so yes. if you're in hawaii <laughs> it could be in in makiki moili ili hawaii kai uh yeah. away from the water it's still going to have the same yeah, yeah. it's still going to have the higher same elevations right yeah so let's tell let's let's go at the sequence of events what occurred so definitely um this 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 sheared it was this was a catastrophic event it sheared every insert and every insert didn't have to shear there was nothing there structurally but eventually whatever was left of any of the rust inserts they basically just says yeah we can't hold it and the guy said i was there at 5 30 in the morning having my coffee and a smoke and it didn't fall and then he mentions that his son-in-law and his daughter walk in and they see the collapse the shake of the door, the opening up of a slider. I mean, what the, a heavy pigeon? What happened here for this thing by itself to basically shear off the building? Okay, it sheared off the building. It ripped off the top railing round, right? As you can see down below. And then all of a sudden it hit that corner of the where the guy is to the right. You see that it it hit, it definitely hit that corner. And then it bounced where the guy is, and there must be about eight feet of of roof there, right? You estimate about eight feet of a bump out? And it basically came down, damaged the lower rail, hit where that guy was, right? And then it continued to roll. It had so much kinetic energy that it just kept going. And where did it roll to? It rolled to here. When I first saw this picture, I thought it was the railing embedded in the dirt. I said, oh, a piece of railing embedded itself in the dirt, only to find out that how that extra sand got on top, I don't know. But look at all the people it didn't kill who were sunbathing on the right, all the people it didn't kill or hurt sunbathing to the left. Of all the places it could have fallen, it hurt two people, enough scratches, whatever, they there, this uh, death was avoided. It, crazy injury was avoided, and it hit the ground. And um, let's take a peek. Let's take a closer peek. You want to make any comments? These towels represent people that ran away. Yeah, I, I would like to make a comment. Uh, somebody else looked at this photo. Um, you know, bef before you installed uh, the rectangle red lines, and they said. Wow, this is interesting because I see the metal railing, but what happened to the concrete wall that you were telling me about? And I said, look closely. And he looked closely. He said, I thought that was sand. I said, no, that's actually concrete that fell off, right? That's the railing wall that fell off onto the sand. The reason why there's all that sand there is if you have some heavy weight and you, and you let's say you threw, threw a, a, a heavy object. Boulder. 
into yeah. into the sand. The sand's going to kick up and land partially on an object. So if you look, there's a lot of sand that's covered up that wall. So it looks like it, it's only sand. But if you look closer, you can see concrete. So there it is. That slab, if it hit anybody, it would cause, in, I believe, instant death. The railing got bent up a little bit simply because it hit some of these chairs. The slab is six inches thick. It's a one-piece concrete, and it didn't crack. I don't see a crack. I could be wrong. I could Maybe this is the crack right here. You know what I'm saying? It, it split into two pieces. I think it did shatter here. But look at all the inserts. What I'm supposed to see here is pieces of steel sticking up four to six inches. Every one of these was four to six inches. It's already embedded into it four inches. When they, when they made it, the steel is embedded. I would assume... These are all half inch thick raw steel. And it was embedded into the floors up above at least four to six inches, maybe longer usually. And look, these are all the points where it's sheared. Look at the end here. Look how it destroyed the, the, the cement here at the end. This is from the fall. This, this to me, Lance, <clears throat> see that piece over there? It looks intact. I think when it came down and hit that railing down below, I think it hit here, indicating to me uh, that this thing, first of all, is in reverse. I think this piece here and this and this area here, when it it's the piece that would be upstairs to the left. I think this thing came down. This is the extreme left side, and that's the extreme right side because it's intact. I think it sheared first on the left side, came down, hit the railing, hit that walkway. And then it tumbled forward, maybe as in a pirouette. Maybe it was standing up and it pirouetted off of that roof and then came down exactly in the, in this one area that would hurt no one. What's your take on this? Could be, but uh, I think further investigation would tell exactly what happened. Uh, but I want to add that even, even if the, the guy that was on that floor started kicking kicking that railing wall you know with all this might kicking it and doing whatever mm -hmm. and let, let let's say you brought in two 300 pound football players and they started kicking it or whatever that wall shouldn't fall down so yeah the idea is this wall actually fell down on its own and yeah, so yeah. It's, it's even more uh concerning scarier because of that yeah. situation yeah the guy was there in 5.30 in the morning having a cup of coffee and a cigarette. His his uh, daughter and her his uh, his uh, son-in-law there, and they're walking in the room because the room is not ready for them. They're just walking in the room, dropping their, their, their luggage. And as soon as they dropped their luggage, that was enough vibration to go out, plus maybe a heavy pigeon that landed on the railing, and then this thing just took off by itself. And by the way, he was not the only one to witness it so many of the people that were watching uh, from down below watched it fall, and those witnesses would be great to tell us how it fell straight down, how it clipped the railing down below, and then how it hit the walkway, and then how it tumbled forward and into the into the sand. Uh, again, this may be lost, but we may be able to have some witnesses that may come forward and help. So let's talk about it. So right now it's been temporarily uh, secured. Um, again, that room is probably not making any money for, for a long while, but you know, I still have a slab. That's what the slab on the left looked like when it used to be on the right. And so, like you said, it was catastrophic. Okay. The question is not an isolated incident on the structure. It's built in 1969. It's over 55 years old, exposed to the elements. So every one of these is exposed to the elements. And as long as you've got it sealed, as long as you have a way to, for the water to run off that comes on an on on a daily rainstorm and you've got and you do some routine maintenance but if you haven't done any maintenance this is not an isolated incident there's more hand grenades that could go off on this building as well as this building right next to it every building to either side this is the canary in the coal mine this was the first one that we can go play with but right now everybody in in the entire 
like you said, it's not just on the ocean front. It's everybody. If you haven't been maintaining your building in the past 25 to 50 years, you are subject to spalling. All right. This is a concern in California, just so you guys know. So they had a catastrophic event that happened in 2017. A fire escape, I mean, a balcony collapsed on this uh, this apartment building that was no more than 25 years old. It was wood-based. They had about 20 people on this balcony uh, partying. And when it collapsed, it dropped all the 20 people down to the, uh, the balcony below, as well as it dropped seven people, I think five stories down, seven people from Ireland, kids who came over every year to work at the bars and stuff, seven of them died. Two years later, this is the California code that came out. And that, and sometimes, you know, code is written in, in blood. And so it took that catastrophic event in Berkeley, California, to then in 2019, just at the beginning of, of the pandemic with COVID, what happened was they, they put this law out that says, hey, all building standards, all decks and balconies are required to be inspected every six years. Forget Farscape already has its own five-year rule. This is every wood deck in all of California must be inspected every six years, and you must have proof, must be done by a third party. So anything that's elevated, anything that's an area of refuge, anything that's a Romeo and Juliet balcony, any decks on the back of your building must be inspected because it took seven dead Irish kids to basically force this upon all of California. And like you said, Lance, you can't ignore it for too much longer because pretty soon, uh, uh, since code is written in blood, the last thing you need is some more fatalities that affect the tourism industry that all of a sudden things are going to start coming in, especially with inspections. So let's move on. Lance, you were uh, in, in, uh, in, you had an interview with uh, Diane. I'll play a little bit of it, Lance, and then uh, we're going to go into your class of you teaching us about spalling. Okay. So let me play a little bit of, for you guys. Related incident. Is that called spalling when the concrete rots within the, I mean, when the metal rots inside the concrete? Yeah, that's actually a condition of spalling. Spalling occurs when water enters the concrete and hits the reinforcing steel called rebar, and then the rebar expands. And when the rebar expands, it cracks the concrete around it. So that's basically the definition of spalling. And spalling is due to uh, environmental conditions uh, such as uh, humidity, rain, sun, uh, salt water, salt air. In Hawaii, there's a lot of salt in the air. And because the hotel is located right on the beach, it gets because of the trade winds, it gets hit with a lot of salt air landing on everything, the concrete walls, the lanai floor, and that kind of thing, metal railing. How long do you think that this was wrestling? Uh, it didn't happen overnight. I would say between five to eight years, something like that. So I lived in a condo where we, you know, had a lot of spalling work and it, it took like two years. It takes forever. It seems to do it and it's really noisy. But what I don't know is, are the hotel engineers required to run around and check for these kinds of issues? Would they have known? Do you think they were remiss in checking? Well, it should be a protocol for each building, whether it's a hotel or condo, apartment, office building, and such, to have some kind of preventive maintenance schedule and inspection, uh, going around looking at these uh, conditions like peeling paint, rust stains around the metal railings and metal objects and so forth. And then at certain time points, say maybe five, 10 years, they should hire an independent uh, structural engineering company to do investigation. Uh, it's not, from what I saw, looking at other balconies in a hotel, it wasn't that obvious. Uh, although I did see some bubbling paint on the underside of the some of the lanais, which would be indicative of possibly water going through the, the tile or the surface of the lanai slab and then penetrating down into the concrete. So that's, that's another indication. But uh, I know that uh, I, I work with a lot of condo buildings and I know a lot of them do not have inspections done. So it should be uh, best practice to have 
inspections done even by the in-house personnel, but um, you know, hire third party inspectors and consultants to, to help with that. I know money's an issue and that's probably why they don't do it, but uh, that could that could save in the long run. Sometimes there's uh, what needs to be done is destructive testing and that's like cutting pieces of concrete out looking at the uh, attachment of the railing uh, base the anchor points and all that for rust and for road. sometimes that needs to be done it's uh costly and expensive because on a high-rise building you have to rig the building like go on the roof and hang their uh, scaffolding system and drop down on the building so of course to set that up you know costs thousands of dollars and then your manpower and so to for the fix on this condition it's going to require a lot of inspections destructive testing engineering work uh, some initial design work and and then the fix the fix is going to so uh while, while i have you here lance and you obviously go this was an 18 minute interview you did we clipped about six six minutes of it and lance you've basically hit it on the on the button right now there there needs to be an investigation if there was a routine investigation that involved destructive and they basically sampled various parts of a building and they basically went to say how are my connections of these cement pieces right now they have no choice but to get into that mode and sample all over the building and say okay uh how what is the case because this one is the this extreme might be the extreme for every one of these balconies, or this extreme could be an isolated situation where all of a sudden, yes, there was a huge amount of water getting in at that particular cracks. And all of a sudden, when they do their investigation of all the balconies, they say, you know what? I found seven that were very similar where water was definitely getting in there. Let's fix those right away, either from the rooftop coming down and fixing or, or vice versa. But um, it looks like you hit all the buttons. Would you like I think the next step we're going to be asking you is, can you give us a quick little class on, um, on uh, you know, spalling? Can you do that? Because uh, if anybody wants to watch that interview with Diane, it's 18 minutes long and you go into pricing and you go not on this job, but what to, how to avoid pricing. But you want to give us a little quick class on, on spalling? Yeah. Before I do that, um, I, I mentioned at the interview that the cost to repair is going to be in the millions millions of dollars it's not going to be a cheap fix so uh along those lines basically let's start with uh i'll give you you know one minute spalling 101 oh well you kind of have it here let's let's look at the slides i actually created a uh this is what uh was from my webinar uh concrete uh spalling so main cause of spalling rain sun wind you got a lot of uh, corrosive environment, humidity, salt air. Be sure to look at your building. If it has failing paint, bubbling paint, no paint, if you can see uh, bare concrete or streaks of concrete, you're overdue. It's time to paint. Normally, the cycle for painting is like eight to 10 years. And then you do a condition survey of your building. You confirm quantities. Usually, that's done with a consultant, engineer, or a contractor, and we're talking about a combination of concrete spalling that would include railing. So in inspection methodology, there's non-destructive where it's visual, we're just looking at stuff, and then we got destructive where it's sounding. We take chains or a hammer, start pounding areas of concrete. Like you see right there, right? You can see the rust stains already, so something is going on there. What's causing the rust? Is it rebar rusting? Is it the railing that's rusting? But definitely, that's cause for concern. And so, if I may, and yeah. the, you know, the great thing about iron, it will give you a showing. It'll show itself in brown, rusty. We call it dragon tears, you know what I'm saying? But basically, it'll give you years in advance notice that something is happening. And after you paint over it and it gets brown again, you, you're, you're, you're basically covering up uh, something that is trying to tell you, I have a problem. Water is getting in through my porous concrete. It's attacking the non uh, non coated rebar, and this is uh, it's only a matter of time before you basically have a problem with the slab and the iron that I'm showing. I'm giving you notice. This is the bell that goes off when iron doesn't like concrete. 
Yeah, but when you see the rust stains, don't just paint over it, right? Oh, I know, but some people do. Oh, yeah, they do. And then later on, there's a problem. So yeah, gathering you know they information. Do? You know what they do with cruise boats when they pull into a lot of the Caribbean islands? Basically, they've always put a guy out there just painting the boat white. So if there's any rusty streaks on a cruise boat, there's a guy that paints it every time it pulls into a dock. But they do have a maintenance program that every so often they, when it's in dry dock, they basically go in and attack the source of that rust because they have a maintenance program. But in the meantime, they do, there is painting cover up on cruise boats, but there's also painting covering up in a lot of these apartments and condos and hotels. That's right. So continuation with the spalling, uh, gather all the information you can, compile all the results, and then let's go to the next slide. Um, types of spalling by location, overhead horizontal spalls, which is your ceiling and your horizontal means your lanai slab or uh, overhead is your ceiling vertical spalls is by uh walls so anytime you have any walls vertical areas of concrete that's in a spall that's the location so spalling when it's determined the contractors bid on it they're going to bid on pipes of spall overhead vertical and so forth Here's a good definition. The leading edge is the edge right at your lanai. And you can see that's like very spalled. You got rusted rebar. And then there's two Explain types Explain what of, a lanai is, Lance. Oh, What's it's a, a lanai? Lanai or balcony where you, you're in a hotel room or your condo. You walk out to look at the view. That's what the lanai or balcony is. Now, this okay. one doesn't have any railing because they removed the railing to fix the spalling. Yep. Now, horizontal, let's talk about a lanai slab or walkway. There's a what's called a partial depth, which is not all the way through. And then a full depth, the image on the right, that's a walkway of a hotel. And you see how bad it is? It's all the way through, so they have to demo practically the whole walkway in order to repair. I mean, you're talking about building building from scratch here. That's a ho actual hotel that I, I worked on. So this could be a condition at a lot of hotels, except it's not known because it's covered up and painted. Well, let's just, let's just make sure everybody understands. You always have three options if time is on your side. One is you can maintain you know, it, it, it's growing. It has its life cycle. You're going to slow down the life cycle. You'll never stop it. You just can slow it down with membranes, with maintenance, and you just maintain, maintain, maintain. But then eventually you're going to have to reinforce so that you can keep what was built there. And reinforcement is just that. It's going to need some help so that basically you can buy a little bit more time with reinforcement. And then if you have no more time, it's called replacement. So every one of these people, if they were to get a proper inspection, they would be told by somebody like yourself to say, listen, we can maintain. We're going to have to reinforce in five to 10 years. But, you know, I'm looking at the lifespan that you have of this balcony is going to be 25 years from now. Prepare yourself to replace whatever the situation may be. Because uh, it's going to need heavy. Because I can't. We can't stop what's already starting in in slabs that have untreated rebar inside. We can slow it way the hell down, but we'll never stop it. Because just under natural humidity and natural porous of a of a cement, they'll get wet and they'll dry all by themselves. You're just stopping additional water intrusion. But you know what? You'll never stop it. So this is just what buying time. And then from you and every every time you go and do an investigation, you're going to tell people, hey, you got it in time, let's maintain. Hey, you didn't get it in time, let's reinforce. Hey, you, uh, you're you going to have to replace. And so this hotel that we're talking about my, right now might be in one of those that minimally, to secure the situation, they're going to have to reinforce all these balconies, whether they need it or not, based on this first, first investigation that we got. Do you agree with that, Lance? Yeah, I, I totally agree. All right, so let's continue going. Let's see what else you got here. Okay, for... additional related cost items uh, for spalling, the crack fill. It's not spalled, but there's cracks. You fill it, paint it. Uh, rebar replacement, you cut out rebar, uh, replace it. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there's uh, now better rebar. There's uh, epoxy coated, and there's also yep. 
uh, fiber uh, bars, uh, gator oh, bar, for bar. example, and those don't corrode because there's no metal inside it, uh, right. which is good. And then you have a CMU block uh, spalls, water gets in. If you look at the picture on the right, uh, it's not painted, so there's no protection. I mean, the paint or waterproofing is like paint on a car. If you don't drive around, you don't have paint on your car, it's going to start rusting. It's the same way with a building. Yeah. You know, any kind of concrete. Uh, additional cost items, caulking, sealant, very important at your uh, openings where you have your windows, your walls, sliding glass. O older building, uh, you're looking at now, this is an old apartment building where they have solid metal, iron railing. And once the railing gets corroded, you can't, you can't, paint over it like scrape the paint the corrosion off and paint it's too bad you're going to have to weld a new piece in and then mm -hmm. on the right you have uh the newer in the 70s aluminum railing hollow aluminum and this one has uh embedded so the railing posts are embedded in the concrete what happens is water seeps in where the posts are anchored into the concrete and then you have spalling so the yeah. idea is to drill and fill. What that means is you drill holes in and you inject some kind of uh, material in it so that um, the humidity doesn't build up excess water at the base of the pulse. And that's what causes the spalling. And then um, people who are going out to, to bid for spalling repair, you're going to get a base bid uh, versus unit costs. I always, when I'm running my spalling projects, ask for a base bid from the contractor and unit costs. The caveat is beware of the lowest bidder because the quantities may be different. Your, your low bid may be lesser quantities than the highest bid. So it's best to double check everything and understand you know, what you're looking at. Hire a consultant. Spalling repair is not easy to do. It's uh, uh, technical in nature. So you need to hire consultants to help guide you along the way. Can you speak a little bit more about uh, cement um, and how, uh, you know, when you do a one piece pour, it's monolithic, but as soon as you put in a repair, those two pieces of cement don't like each other from the get go. Okay. Well, it's funny that you mentioned the word cement because cement is actually concrete. I'm, I'm one sorry. part of concrete. So the cement along with, aggregate water and sand mix it all together dries becomes concrete of course you add reinforcing steel in it so cement is just one part of it this there's a lot of misunderstanding of the term like if you look at the high-rise building like one is oh that building's a cement building that's actually not it's a concrete building made of cement right so no but i'm, I'm saying two when you do have spalling and you have your concrete first slab built 55 years ago, and then you come in and patch it, you know what I'm saying, on the front on the front nose, sometimes the patch, which is also a concrete repair, when the two, when you have two uh, them getting together, sometimes the one will not like the other, unless you have that milk that you put on there to make sure you, you know, marry them together. But two separate pores at two separate times well, they'll act differently in uh, in the future when there's heat and the humidity. One uh, that's been around for fifty five years will act differently than one that you just poured a year ago. Yeah, yeah, concrete. you're you're right. You're right. Um, that's why there's uh, we use specialized uh, concrete, structural concrete, that's a little different from the concrete bags that you buy at the you know home improvement store. So. Mm -hmm. The concrete we use is 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 the mixture of aggregate built in, and it, and sometimes it has the corrosion protection built in also. Gotcha. So you got bids, like you say, be aware of the lowest bid, so you know uh, you, you get a consultant to help you understand. Everything has a per unit price. Everything has an estimated area of cost, and you can always say, you know, this job should be no more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And if you're getting bids in three fifty, four fifty land. And you're also getting bids in 150. You have to be careful of those. But most educated building uh, engineers know the approximate cost of something. So be careful and always get a third party to help you decide who to pick. Uh, so any uh, further now, base bid, unit cost, you talked about that, right? So yeah, you have to be this, careful. This is that... just an analysis based on 
uh, um, you know, jobs that I work on and trying to educate property managers, board members, and, and even contractors. Uh, it depends on the, the unit costs of what they're charging. And uh, let me explain. The unit cost is, let's say you have a spall and it's a per square foot uh, spall or per lineal foot spall. There's a unit cost uh, per square foot or per linear foot. So every contractor is not bidding using the same numbers. One contractor A might bid $150 per square foot and contractor B might bid $125 per square foot. So it, it all depends. It's just good to have somebody help you analyze all the numbers. Yeah, we call it apples for apples bidding. Sometimes you'll accept apples for oranges bidding because you know everybody's looking at it a little bit different. That's not too bad. And sometimes that's all you can use and you have to go. But as soon as you get apples for bananas, there's a monkey in the in the mix and you got to identify that person and get them out of the of the bid process. It only confuses everybody because now you're going to try to get the apples pricing guy to to match the price of the bananas guy and the bananas guy is nowhere he's nowhere in the game. He doesn't know what he's doing. And so yeah, it's very important call, that it's apples for apples. Then you call the next contractor and he gives you a lemon. Yeah, and then there's lemon, the sour guy. So yeah, tell so us about Oh, we okay. So, about this. yeah. Thanks for asking. This is interesting. Uh, I don't. I don't only sit around and rest on my laurels. I actually educate myself. I go and uh, spend money and time. And this one, I attended the. Uh, it was in Las Vegas, uh, uh, called the uh, the Concrete Expo, and it's huge. Just like thousands thousands of contractors and engineers that that go go to that and there's we learn concrete repair specs general industry standards there's aci american concrete institute uh i cry we call it the international concrete repair institute so believe it or not for spalling repair we got a lot of specs and industry standards that we can rely on. It's not just going there and hey, fix this spall and, and be done with it. So yeah, yeah. It, it becomes an art and a science at the same time. There's a whole bunch of stuff to learn. And it's not only concrete because there's corrosion factor, like you mentioned, um, and, and it, it goes hand in hand. So, and we're not only talking about uh, uh, high rise buildings uh, per se, we, we talk about bridges and roadways and, uh, uh, mines and all that. So it's all uh, lumped it together. It's amazing the different uh, trades that, uh, and it's available every year. And people who are in the industry, I urge you to, uh, you know, attend because there's a lot to learn. Thank you for that piece. I'll, I'll tell you also, I also went to Las Vegas. I was invited by the AIA. I taught a fire escape class, the first ever in the nation, if not the world. There's never been a fire escape class. And I taught a fire escape class in Las Vegas and it's just that you go there to get educated, but you can also go there to educate others. And I taught the first ever AIA fire escape awareness class, um, not only in the U.S., but also in the world, because there was nobody else has ever even thought about it. Because, as you know, fire escapes are the bastard child of egress, out of sight, out of mind. And until it hurts or kills somebody, nobody cares about other egress issues, which we'll get into later on in this seminar. So let's talk about uh, some of these other things. Oh, yeah. Concrete repair specs, uh, demolition, chipping protocol. Here's where it gets technical. Uh, if you look at the photo, it's uh, you got railing and a balcony. You have exposed rebar. You see the horizontal bars. Um, you don't have just the contractor just chip willy-nilly and then repair it. We require saw cutting and geometric shapes. So when they pour back the concrete, you know, it looks nicer. It's either a square or a rectangle or something. It doesn't look like some weird uh, jigsaw puzzle. And then uh, we require demolition three inches beyond the corrosion. So you have a corroded rebar. That's not where it ends. We go and demo more concrete three inches beyond that so that and, and look for a better condition rebar so that when we pour back, we're we're pretty much uh, known that it's not going to spall anytime soon in the future because we took care of the corrosion, not only the corrosion, but areas where it wasn't corroded. Then if you look at the other image, it's me at the World of Concrete show. I entered this contest. Um, 
you know, they give you time and you mix your concrete, you fill in this little box and uh, trowel it and all that. And I won second place. Second place, what was the prize? Nothing. First place is $1,000. So <laughs> I almost won. And the guy who won it was a contractor. And he said, hey, uh, you did pre a pretty good job. What contract do you work for? I said, I'm an engineer. I don't do this for a living, but I inspect your guy's work. He felt sorry for me. He took me to lunch. <laughs> Listen, I'll give you my uh, concrete story. And I want to ask you right afterwards, um, who put rebar and and concrete together? I want to see if you can tell me when, wh what year did that finally come in? Because I understand why rebar is a brother to concrete, uh, especially in certain construction. But let me tell you what I had. My first involvement of rebar and concrete was in uh, San Diego. I'm not San Diego, in Long Beach, California. I got a firescape inspection on a building built in 1917. It was a complete concrete building, no iron other than rebar everywhere. And even the fire escapes were all uh, made of concrete. The stairs were all made of concrete. The supports were made of concrete. The slabs and the, and the platforms were made of concrete. And I got my first lesson on just spalling and what happens. But again, it was a 1917 building. We had so much spalling happen and exactly what you just described. We had to go and in this and go beyond two to three inches beyond every rebar, cut out every rotten rebar, reinstalled with wiring of some sort, new rebar that had obviously, um, you know, some protection uh, and back in. So it's not, hey, knock on this, and just just coat the rotten rebar. It's not. You gotta, in some cases, remove that rebar, put in fresh rebar, uh, and then re-cement it back in with concrete. So, uh, but who married? Who came up with this crazy idea that uh, reinforced concrete with rebar was an answer for slabs, buildings, and all that? When when did that happen? I'm not really sure. I think it was like around early 1900s or something like that. When, when rebar uh, first came, came on the market. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, here's a little backstory. I was in, in, in Rome um, about a year ago and I inspected buildings there, Colosseum and you know old, old buildings that are Cisco. They were older than you, can you believe that? But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, they didn't use rebar. None of those buildings had rebar. They had just blocks carved carved out of limestone or marble or whatever, and uh, they laid those blocks together, and it, it was precise. I couldn't even fit my credit card in the joints. That's how close it was. So I'm thinking, you know, how can they build these big buildings, pyramids, and a Colosseum building way back thousands of years ago, and they're still standing, and today they're building these high-rise reinforced buildings and in 15 20 years we've got problems so something's wrong wrong yeah here. or but, total collapse like it happened in florida right what happened in right? florida yeah so uh continuing on concrete repair specs there's a rebar replacement protocol you don't just throw rebar in any anywhere anytime uh corrosion remover and treatment you know, you have to grind the rebar, remove the corrosion to treat it uh, before. Now, if the piece of rebar, the cross section, and if you're looking at uh, the rebar, um, the cross section, if it's uh, corroded uh, more than 50%, then we spec out that you got to take that piece of rebar out and put a new one in. So we don't Correct. we don't leave the old rebar there, even if they grind it down and you can see nice shiny metal. Uh, that's a no-no. Uh, concrete product, we specify the type of product. Concrete coverage, curing time. Concrete coverage is important because so many buildings built, they don't have two inch concrete cover uh, over the rebar. You got one and a half or you got a quarter inch or whatever. And that's a, a problem with spalling because you don't have enough concrete covering the rebar and it's easy for the rebar to get wet and corrode. Uh, Documentation, when you're doing a concrete spall project, take make sure the contractor takes before and after photos, right? Before, during, and after. I require all of that just, just to back up the, the charges and all that. So that, that middle picture is nice because that's actually, I took that photo of a, a 
piece of area in a road. They had a concrete roadway and they didn't have enough coverage and cars drove over it. That's why that piece is shiny because the wheels of the, the vehicles were cleaning the rebar. So it's always shiny like that. We take measurements, we document location, spa type. So we don't just tell the contract to fix the spa. We document every, basically every square inch of re repair that they're doing because they're charging unit costs. So yeah, this is of a, a basement parking area. So we measure it, document what was done and all that. So, so we're, we're here now. Uh, we're getting closer to the end. And um, these people want to know what to do. Okay. So let's play some suggestions. Let's tell everybody just what's going on, what you can do. So we have your this first guy. <clears throat> he's Joe Maintenance. He's Joe Maintenance in your building. And he's got a he's got his screwdriver with him. You know what I'm saying? And um, so we're going to have a little fun, but at the same time, tell you what you can do. And again, we already talked about this. You can only, you can maintain your fire escape because you have a program of some, I mean, you're not your fire escape, your railings. So maintain them because there's nothing wrong with them. They just, yes, yeah, stay on top of them, keep maintaining them. You can reinforce them because in your investigation, you found, my God, they're weak, not broken, not catastrophic. They're just weakened. Yeah, I definitely see rust. I definitely see that it's wiggling a little bit. Reinforce it. Same bolts, same connection, or reinforce it. Add a clip. Do whatever you have to do. Or you're at a catastrophic state. You got to replace. Those are your only three options to buy time. That's the only three options you have. Keep maintaining. Reinforce and then keep maintaining. And be prepared because it's so advanced that you are definitely 5, 15, 25 years away from replacement. Because once you've let it go a little bit, it's already accelerating. You have to do it. So here's the first guy you're going to use. And this is, we call him Joe, Joe uh, Facilities Director. He's the guy that gets sent out and he's going to do his thing. He's going to wiggle the railings and he's going to do this. going to go to the other side and say so he's going to wiggle that side it looks pretty good and he says oh i forgot to test it and he's going to so guys sometimes that's all you can afford <laughs> right lance a little that's something right. is better than nothing guys so if your maintenance guy is going to do a visual examination okay the second option you have is you hire somebody that's inexperienced. He's already got his engineer's hat. He just came out. He doesn't have as many years as Lance. And he says, you know, I, I think I got a, I got a program and uh, I'm going to do this. And he brings you to his factory or to where he says, let me show you what I'm going to do for you. He goes, I kick harder than anybody else. And that's his, his attack plan for you is that if I can't kick it, um, uh, then, you know, so guys, um, there, you do need a third party professional person. And a lot of times the documents that you need at the end of the, at the end of the, this needs a structural engineer stamp. Is that correct, Lance? Yep, that's right. Okay. So those two guys will not give you the document you need that you may keep in files that in cases an incident, you will give it to the insurance company and you're covered. When you have a document from an, from somebody that inspected it on a routine basis, let's say every five years, like the rest of America, there's a five-year rule on some of these, including California, which has a six-year rule right now because of an incident. So, But the things that are there, you have to trust your manufacturer. You have to trust your installers. So just so, you, so you're aware, step one, let's trust your manufacturer. Let's trust your installer because they've done testing. And what is their testing? At their factories, they're gonna yank on these railings that they installed. They're gonna yank on the, some of these pieces until the breaking point. 
We are never going to test to the breaking point. We are forced to inspect to see will it handle normal, you know, normal wear and tear. And we only have to have a 200 pound concentrated load. We will never go there and do this. Here we go. Here we go. Let's keep going. Not enough. Let's keep going. No, Lance and I will never, you know what I'm saying, have go to this point that's not we're not going to test it to the breaking point you want a company that you guys trust that basically says give me 200 or 225 concentrated load guys these are companies that have tested the glass railings and how far can you push it then they start testing when if it does shatter what happens it's shattering is it can somebody get through it nope here we're gonna laminated glass is there to protect things from happening. But that's what your manufacturer is doing. They've given you testing and all the railing style that you have, whether they're glass or iron, and their job is to show you that you're not gonna get through the glass, you're not gonna get through the iron, because what the manufacturer and the installer on all your buildings that are hotels and condominiums, uh, even if you wanna take a coffee cup and whip it at the glass, you know what I'm saying? It's made to basically uh, reject. So here's another dropping of the, the ball, a nice iron ball. So trust your manufacturer. What is swing testing? Your manufacturers have all done this. They've thrown, if you throw your body at these things, this is, the res this is where it's gonna have resistance. So we trust that every railing you know, that's been tested to 500 pounds, 1,000 pounds. We only need to test it to 225 pounds. And we don't do this type of swing testing, right? That would involve too much rigging, right, Lance? We'd have to rig up something with a with a cable from above and, you know, and we'd have to have a certain weight bag of some sort, right? And yeah. God forbid one of these things does want to break. We don't want anything falling down below, correct? Right. So everybody has, all over the world, everybody has a little bit of something, an idea of what they're testing. And so we've done this. We've, we've pulled this compilation around there for you guys to show you that trust your manufacturer. What we're testing has already been approved and installed correctly. Now the step is we can do this to the top rail, but we don't have, the all, we don't have this thing that we have to do outside you know, every hotel room. So we're gonna be manually testing after the installation. What is that? It's basically a, a contraption of some kind that allows us to manually push on the glass down below, push on the railing up above, 225 pounds, Lance. Is that good enough for you? Well, yeah, that is. I mean, the cold is 200, but uh, remember, that's just the minimum standards. Right, well, that's all they want. We don't, they don't tell us to test it to the breaking point, right? So no, we go no, to 225 and we push on the middle, we push on the top, and we push on the two ends that has the attachments, right? So mm -hmm. at most fires, most railing or balconies are going to get tested in three locations. The left, the right, the middle. And if it has a long balcony, you're going to get the left, the right, the middle, and then splitting that difference. So you're going to get five tests. Is that satisfactory to you, Lance? Would that be satisfactory to you? Yeah. Okay. Let's keep it going. So this is that screw. You know what I'm saying? Uh, any any contraption, uh, you know, we have we can manually, to keep costs down, you got to stay away from the hydraulics. Here's a guy a testing test, cement concrete, pre -cast concrete, uh, railings. Failed, Check this out. Children were playing on them. They broke from underneath the children. So today we're testing additional balusters to see if they can withstand the the load capacity set forth by the Florida Building Code. But here we have our load test area. We have concrete balusters. This is the site we've chosen for load test. We're going to be forming two tests, a 400 pound point load test, and up to a 100 pound distributed load test. These concrete balusters are installed. They're supposed to be pinned. They're supposed to be anchored to the concrete slab that's below them. In this case, it doesn't appear that they were anchored everywhere. That's why we're testing them. Now our test rig is set up. We have load at about six pounds to start, so it's essentially zero. We're ready to start. Okay, test was completed at 400 pounds. Point load application at the top of the baluster. All we observed was the rail starting to pull away from the column. No other damage observed. Here's our second testing setup. We're testing the intermediate point on the baluster. The 2001 Florida Building Code specifies 200 pound at any intermediate member. So we'll be testing 200 up to a 
load of 400 pounds, which will be double a two times safety. The balusters have sustained a 400 pound point load without any cracking or noticeable displacement. We're going to let it sit for a few minutes and make sure that nothing else happens. So if I may, uh, Lance, you agree with that, right? Uh, it, some A lot of railings maybe in Hawaii, that you're going to have some beautiful ones made out of these concrete pieces, uh, properly put together, properly attached. You want a low test, uh, at the, a point low test at the top of the rail, a point low test at the middle, and then he toasted, he, he tested, uh, I don't know if he showed it on here, but he brought 500 pounds of weight to do 400 pounds of testing. Is that pretty much the, the right way to do it? And it's pretty... Pretty manual what he's done there. He's got 50 pound sandbags, created this 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 resistance wall, for lack of a better, and then he's doing his test. Would you agree with that? Would you sign off on that if he did it to that way and gave you back information? Yeah, except I don't think uh you need to go four hundred, five no three hundred, four hundred. That's overkill. That's overkill. It's 220, 200 is the minimum, and we do two two twenty five just to play it uh, play it safe, meaning that it's it's the it's the ass test. If my ass drinking and smoking leans on that thing, you're exerting about 200 pounds on a lean. And not even that, you know, a body that it weighs 200 pounds leaning on a railing is only exerting about 100, 125 pounds. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, maybe instead of bringing all the equipment, we'll just have you lean on the railing. <laughs> uh, Lance, we, we can't go there, Lance. Come on. There we go. Hydraulic testing. These are the guys that are going to come in and they're going to bring hydraulics. They're going to bring in, hey, we need to attach. We may have to cut off your floors. They've got their hydraulic pumps and they're going to test your inside railings, your outside railings. So these are just examples of what we found on the Internet of, you know, how disruptive some of these things are. So you better have a, a sample, a simple system to go and test these rails for 200 pounds. So here's another system that they come in and they're going to exert uh, 400. As you can see, they're really they're bringing it to the breaking point only 200 is needed you don't need 300 or 400 and again this is on a glass you know what i'm saying so you need to do it in the middle you need to do it on top you need to do it on the sides because you're really testing the fasteners on either side right so let's keep it going let's see what as you can see glass my god is very strong unbelievably strong and we're only testing to 200 so some of the posts that are holding these things up have been tested by the manufacturers you know what I'm saying? So the hydraulic people, when they get in, they test at the factory, they test at the at the uh, testing facilities, they test. So trust me, some of the rails you have bought, you know what I'm saying, are acceptable. Look, they push these things to a thousand pounds and they, so we are, we are accepting that the manufacturers and the installers are putting in a product that will resist minimally 200 pounds. You agree with that, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So some of these tests are horizontal. Some of these tests are going to be vertical. You know what I'm saying, and they're putting a lot. So we believe that everything we're going to be looking at is uh, is manufacturer tested. And one of the things we're not going to do is test from the top coming down. You know what I'm saying? And that's one of that's a test that you're going to see here. That's the horizontal resistance of 400. There's the horrors, the vertical resistance. We're never going to do this, right, Lance? There's no vertical testing of any kind, correct? No, you don't need to do that. Now, some of you don't. Some of the hotels may not even have glass. They may have mesh. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you may have to you have to test this mesh to see if it doesn't pull away or dis, disassemble itself in certain testing. So, uh, again, anything and everything is for can people get through glass or get through the mesh? Um, this is uh, obviously stress testing it beyond the 200, but this is again a compilation of all the things out there in the country that we've been looking at. Uh, here's the tool. This is a $5,000 tool made of aluminum. It has the, you know, and for these guys to bring these tools or buy or have five or 10 of these tools at your apartment or your condo or your hotel, uh, these things ain't cheap. So again, depending on who you pick to do the job, will be determined by, you know, so how can we simplify this so that all of a sudden, pound, you know, this is some of the work inch. that we've done when we we well, have to lateral test, test, test every fire escape, old yeah. or new. Took 200 pounds, I and all it is is we have a simple mechanism that exerts a force and pushes out there. in several here. locations. 
So this is where, you know, some of the hotels and some of the apartments you have that have railings outside on cement slabs, um, they need those railings tested. Right, Lance? On both sides. Yep, that's right. So you might have uh, wood structures. You might you might have a wood structure that has these aluminum railings. They too need to be tested. And what is it? Simple 200 pounds. So create the tool that basically is gonna allow you to basically exert a standardized force of 225 pounds. By the way, Lance, whether it's wood or cement stairs, this is called a cascading load test. And depending on the size, you're gonna put anywhere from 350 to 450 pounds of weight and that's all you do, just cascade. It's like a rolling weight box is coming down, all the way down. So Lance, if somebody did this for you, would you okay it? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, but I'm kind of concerned because I definitely know a lot of buildings are not gonna pass that. <laughs> well, we always do a pre-load test evaluation. Don't think we just load test things. As soon as we find deficiencies, you can't load test. You stop the load test. A pretty low test evaluation will have deficiencies, means you have to repair it before we can load test it. And the key about load testing is this, there is no load testing after you fix something because you fixed it. It's in the code. The, the NFPA code says, the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by load test or other evidence of strength. And what is that? If you fixed it, repaired it back to its original condition, there is no load test for the next 15 to 25 years. So again, if you're on a fire escape, if you're testing a ladder, some of these things will apply. You do have a few fire escapes left in your in your entire uh, island. Not many. The rest have all been replaced with cement. And this is called a load test that involves 100 pounds per square foot on cement and or steel. And a majority of Hawaii is cement poured in place staircases. But this is just us showing you again you know, cascading load tests. In some cases, there's no other way to load test it other than to bring 50 pound sandbags to the location and we, we cascade coming down. So you load test the first platform, 100 pounds per square foot means that a 10 by 10 uh, fire uh, or a five by 10 uh, fire escape is gonna need 5,000 pounds of weight on that. And this is, and these are all cement these are all cement stairs. You know, the ones that you buy and then you just attach to the metal stringers, uh, weld them to it. So how, how do you load test those? The best way to load test cement stairs is to basically do what's called a cascading load test. So after you complete the load test at the very top, you then come down. And as you can see, Lance, unlike you, I do work sometimes on low tests. You know what I'm saying? I just yeah, don't I, ride around I, in my Mercedes like, like you do. I, I like that. I even saw uh, a little image of you on your phone ordering lunch so that's there good. you go um <laughs> so this is called a cascading load test and basically for a period of time you just keep moving the treads for five to 15 minutes uh to the next and that's us doing the um lateral load test on the on the railings using that mechanism that tool and we just you know basically exert 200 pounds to make sure it's going to hold this is us on a very small platform in seattle and as you can see, the weight boxes, which carry anywhere from 30 to 50 pounds, are basically there so that, you know, you, you have to low test. It's required by law. In certain states in, in the U.S., they've already mandated the low testing of all fire escapes, okay? And, uh, and so this is a, what's called a fold-out ladder so that when you're ready to use it and to keep people from breaking into your building, you would use that, okay? Um... Again, no ladders allowed. This is load testing procedures. You have to submit this to some city officials to say, what are you gonna do? Show me before you do it. So we have load test procedures. This is some of the strapping that you would use when you're load testing, you know, uh, these. some of these have 2,000 pound rating, 5,000 pound rating. You have a one ton uh, or two ton crank, you know, chain fall. Uh, you use uh, obviously your, your, um, your digital scales as needed. Uh, so, you know, 48 cases of 30 pounds is, you know, this is how you transport it back and forth. Uh, this is going to be us in, in California, load testing a very small system. Again, you know, load testing the left and the right, hammer test all the staircases. Um, and then what you have is uh, the uh, following video is going to be us load testing the left and the right side simultaneously. 
of right. a, um, we'll of a fire escape where you put up 40% okay. we take measurements all of these. before, during, and after. And uh, uh, what you want to do is you want to basically not load test the same floor at the same time. So alternating are floors are being load tested here. And you can get in and out. See the guy measuring the before, during, and after just to make sure there's no deflection. The guy at the very top is doing lateral load Double testing, so it's a team of three to five, five depending. Transfer and the key something. right now is just, you know, to move how are you exerting 100 pounds per square foot Perfect. on some of these 75 right. so, to 125 year old structures? Okay. And uh, what do we have left? What do we have left is now back to you. Because what happens here, Lance? is that we have an, uh, a not an isolated incident that occurred on Hawaii. The, the building to the left is just as concerning as the building to the right of this. But you have a piece here that two years ago, no, in 2017, Lance, uh, what's there was up? a two, death. Yeah, 2016. 2016, there was a death, and you. this is the extras. Whether it be the egress extras, whether it be uh, railings, and whether it be, you know, uh, you, you conclude on another video we're going to show. Um, but before we uh, get started, let's see if anybody has questions for us before we talk about the third thing that needs to be looked at. Because we're focusing on balconies and railings, and that's what this is about, because it will hurt or kill somebody. But let's see if anybody has a question for us from, from the, the people out there. Questions, well, anybody? I got a question from a member in the audience. Yeah. Um, she's a newly mom, and she wants to know what age is considered to be a safe, um, what age is considered to be safe for a child to be out in the balcony. She's a new, she's a newly mom. So. I have an answer for that. Um, and Lance will probably uh, comment on this also, but the law has made it so that a four inch ball, a four inch ball of any child, any age cannot get through the bars. So what age can I leave my child out there? I don't recommend it unattended, but you are now protected. All railings will not let a child's head before it used to be six. And then before that was eight inches separation right now, the average is three and a half inches in behind, but a four inch sphere cannot go through any of these railings that you see below. Um, because it's uh, against the law. But you may have a pre-existing non-conforming structure, an older building that has six-inch spacing, or it has eight-inch spacing, and uh, that's the key. So, uh, you know, moms, be aware that if you have new railings, the sphere test is the first thing. Uh, and even at the very bottom, it can't be, it's usually two inches at the very bottom to three inches, and not four inches or more, because that's when children can actually crawl underneath. But uh, that's a Lance. You want to throw in uh, a yeah, an answer? yeah. You're answer. right. That you can do a test. Uh, get a tennis ball, and if it can fit through your railing pickets, then it's unsafe. If it doesn't go through, then you're okay. But here's a caveat: even if uh, it meets the code, what if the condition is bad? There's wood rot. If it's wood, if it's metal, it's corroded. If it's concrete, it's spalled. Uh, so just just be careful. Uh, I would say the age of a child, just don't leave children unattended. It's, it may, may be dangerous. Just like in a playground, you don't leave a child unattended. So yeah, that's yep. my comment. So let's let's play this. This one, unlike Moana, Surfside, <clears throat> this one, which you were part of and you were an expert witness on, somebody did die. So let's let's take a let's take a listen. Hey everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. More than a year after a railing gave way and left one man dead, Alawana Shopping Center says it is done fixing the rusty railings. The tragic accident also critically injured another man and shined a critical spotlight on safety at the popular mall. And now that the railing work is done, we wanted to know: Is it safe for shoppers? Our Alexander Zane spoke with a construction expert, Alex. Hi, Marissa. I spoke with our construction expert who tells me he believes the new railings are considerably safer, both because of the design and the material used to build them. 10,000 feet of new railing flanks Alamoana's perimeter and walkways, the condition noticeably different from these pictures taken in 2016. 
Building expert Lance Luke took a look at the new railings today. Alamoana Shopping Center is a lot safer now. Brand new railing with concrete work. In the past, the old uh, design was railing basically to the ground level, and that was part of the problem with the uh, steel railing that corroded, concrete cracking, spalling. The condition of the railings at the state's largest outdoor shopping mall was thrust into the spotlight when one of the banisters gave way in October of 2016. 21-year-old Nicholas Freitas died, and 21-year-old Macroy Nagato was severely injured, having to spend months in a Colorado rehabilitation center. Luke says with construction finished, the railings are up to code and, most importantly, safe. He explains the reason the new railings were made using aluminum rather than steel. Steel actually corrodes. It corrodes a lot faster than other types of metal like aluminum or stainless steel. In a statement, the general manager of Alamoana said today, Alamoana Center is constantly evaluating and adjusting to help in its mission of providing an outstanding environment and experience for all. The attorney for the two victims told me today his client who survived the fall is home but wasn't able to comment on his condition. The city issued the mall a notice of violation after the accident, but the case is closed now that the work is done. Howard Mercer. So, um, Lance. I don't know if you were able to give away, was the settlement, because uh, you were an expert witness on that, was the settlement uh, for the person who died significant and in the millions? Yeah, it, it, it was huge, both for the uh, estate of the, the person that died, and then the other person is actually uh, severely injured for life, basically incapacitated. And so it, it was big. I also want to add that the photo that you saw of the corroded railing, yeah. Uh, with with the heavy corrosion at the base, what was a photo that I took that I gave to the news. The other thing I want to add is that the railing that collapsed was on the third floor. It wasn't on the twentieth floor or or high up. So if you just think about that, three stories, a person falls over because the railing gave way and dies. That's how critical the situation is. So it kind of doesn't matter what floor you're on. The the condition is the railings have to be safe. Uh, an OSHA requirement is that you wear a harness after six feet. So if you're a worker and you and you go up a ladder more than six feet, you're supposed to be in harness because you can fall six feet and kill yourself if you fall just the right way and it involves your head. You know what I'm saying? You will kill yourself after six feet. Yeah, so, there's um, reports. Yeah, you're right. There's reports of people trimming trees, fell off. An uh, older person was on a four-foot ladder. He fell yep. off and died. Yep, because it, 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 the fall, your head, if that's the first thing that hits the floor, the you know it'll crack your neck. It, something will happen, and many people. But OSHA stops any worker from going above six feet on any ladder um, without a harness. And should an event occur, the uh, the owner of the business is held liable for that death simply because liability wise, uh, because they allowed somebody to go beyond six feet without a harness, a full harness. All right, let's let's listen to this. Three days after part of a building collapsed in Kalihi, badly injuring two men, we are hearing from one of the victims. We also learned that city inspectors were at the building last year, but only ordered two small repairs. Our Chelsea Davis is live in Kalihi tonight to tell us more, Chelsea. Ke'ahi Mahea, we are on Pu'uhale Road, and as you can see behind me, no repairs have been done since Monday. There is now yellow police tape around that gap in the second floor of Lanai, and a wooden board blocking that corner. Residents tell me they're afraid to live and sleep here. <laughs> Twenty-five-year-old Edward Samuel says he was roughhousing with a friend on the second floor of this four-story apartment building in Kalihi Monday when the concrete wall gave way. <laughs> His sister interprets for him. The the bricks was co covered him, like was on top of him, the whole body. The men fell about 12 feet. His friend was only slightly hurt, but Samuel was taken to the hospital with serious injuries. His hand, his legs, his head, his eye. 
and then and his mouth inside. The city's Department of Planning and Permitting issued this notice of violation in August of last year. It says a third floor unit was in violation for the front door frame rotting and the concrete eave above the patio was spalling. The city says corrections were made and the owner was not fined. The owner reminded in writing to maintain the structure in safe condition at all times. The violation notice doesn't mention other problems. If I was the building inspector for the city, I would have wrote up additional comments to my report in addition to the specific item that he looked at. But um, I don't know, I can't speak for the city building department. Building expert and construction engineer Lance Luke says it doesn't look like the building was constructed properly or is in compliance with today's standards. And he doesn't believe it's safe for the people to be in there now. It's up to every building owner to maintain their property. It's not up to the city and county building department to go and monitor and inspect every building. That's not their job. The city issued another violation notice after Monday's incident, saying the damaged areas and third and fourth floor railings also need repair. Luke estimates about $800,000 worth of repair work. The city says they did not inspect the entire building and they're still in the process of hiring seven more inspectors. We went to the owner's home to try to speak to them. A woman there said she was the owner's sister and a number she gave me to get a hold of the owners was disconnected. So Lance, uh, sorry about the uh, volume on this one. It was very low, but everybody gets it. This is that extra thing that we talked about that this is an egress investigation now. This is a two-part uh, for you, uh, and that is the building has its own set of problems that are all violations, and the owner may or may not do it while collecting rent. But <clears throat> the one thing that's important for everybody to know, that egress system, and that that's what this was part of, the egress system here is the failure. If they're going to fix anything, mandatory, mm -hmm. It's going to be that egress system so that people can get out by themselves without firefighters. If all of a sudden that egress system is what hurts anybody, your insurance is not going to pay because the way that they can voluntarily get out uh, is the reason why they got hurt. It was preventable. If it's preventable, that means the insurance company is going to say, I'm not going to pay. You could have maintained this. You know what I'm saying? So anytime you could maintain and prevent an incident from occurring, you are liable. The insurance company steps up, steps away and steps out. And uh, you were expert witness on this case also or not, Lance? No, no, I wasn't I wasn't an expert on it. But the, the, the news people asked me uh, what the cost was to repair, and I estimated about $800,000. Now, this is a small apartment building. It's only three and a half stories, four stories, one... Uh, top section but they had major spalling and if you look at the photo that that's a railing wall made out of cmu concrete blocks and about the the fire escape egress uh if there was a fire and people are trying to escape and they end up falling off the railing and and getting injured or dying they didn't they didn't get injured or died from the fire they got injured because the building was unsafe because of the spalling repair so this is just a situation where it was uh, it was pretty bad, and it it uh, it's not only this building; it's a, a lot of older apartment buildings that were built in the '50s, '60s, early '70s have the same kind of construction and uh, exterior walkways for egress for fire safety, uh, corroded railing, and all that. So it's it's all over the place. And then we got high rise condos, which are similar with spalls yeah. so it's uh it's a it's a major problem that we need to address and this this again you know is even though this seminar was on nothing but ra railings and balconies we're basically coming in that the older you get these three to five story buildings their only solution to get these people out of a building is these walls made of cement married to these staircases made of cement married to these railings that keep you inside the stair and keep you inside the platforms that as you exit down and nobody's looking at this, you know what I'm saying? So right now uh, and in our future, uh, any of these buildings that you would be investigating in the future, um, your, your 
you have to make a comment now to whoever you're dealing with to say, hey, you called me here to investigate your building, but I have to give you two reports. One report is that your building needs this on the basement, it needs that on the third floor, and it needs this other thing with spalling, and it needs this other thing. And then you have to write them a separate report and says, hey, just on your egress requirements by law to keep people here paying rent, you or to buy or sell this property, your egress system is compromised. So at this time, I have to notify you that you need to fix this egress system, whether you want to or not, you must fix it because I'm not going to give you a document of any kind that says that everything's okay and you're going to take your sweet time fixing things. Right now, the egress requirement is an aside to the original report. You are required by law with that as soon as you have anything that's a life safety concern or a imminent danger concern to keep your licenses, you must notify the building department or the fire department that there's an imminent danger situation at a building and they take over. You don't have to stay there anymore. But you have to, pr to protect your licenses. What did you know? When did you know it? What did you do about it is the critical piece so that people minimally must maintain their means of egress at all times so that tenants can get out by themselves. Firemen can go in and get people that are incapacitated and firemen can use it to, in cases uh, all hell breaks loose, they know that they can count on the fire escapes. So how many of the buildings you've ever inspected really concern themselves with the egress lens. Oh, there's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch. Um, that the they did I or mean, did not concern themselves with the egress? What was that? Did they concern themselves with the egress or not concern themselves with no, the egress? No, they, they weren't concerned about it. They 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 didn't want to hear about it, basically. <laughs> and then I, I like to throw in another comment about insurance because the insurance companies now are getting really strict and they're not covering buildings that have problems spalling cast iron pipe problems uh egress problems and and so forth so it, it's becoming an insurance situation also yep so let me tell you what happened in boston because we're wrapping up pretty close right now we have a few minutes to go and let's open up to some questions that they may have out there we got about seven minutes in this two-hour seminar but this is what happened in boston that changed fire escapes nationwide. This, this picture that you have here happened out of a four story. So you see the fireman there saving the woman and her niece. All of a sudden, instantaneously, the catastrophic collapse of a fire escape that should never fall, never, it's impossible. But when you ignore it for 50 years, it, this is what happened. Look at her falling, uh, look, at all the, look at her niece, look at all that grating, all that weight. He saved himself because his hand is extending. He grabbed the ladder in 1975. The fire truck ladder that came up to grab him, uh, he grabbed it. He saved himself. She died. This one, uh, this went all across the country, to Chicago. They showed the picture. It won a Pulitzer Prize for this guy for this photo. And all of a sudden, only, only in Boston did they change the law because she died they said, hey, we should be looking at these fire escapes. We shouldn't rely on owners to maintain their fire escapes. We should have a five-year rule. So they did. They changed the law. It's the only, it's the only state that had a five-year rule on fire escapes till 2012. The only state that had a five-year mandate is only Massachusetts till 2012 when the IFC finally came in. And here we are back in Boston just last year, the Boston Globe put out an article, right, with a brand new mayor. And what did she find? That, you know, we thought we had this under control. We found out that of the 9,637 fire escapes, only 3,000 in the history since 1975 have been certified. So there's 6,000 uncertified fire escapes in Boston. And it took a fatal collapse but all of a sudden, now landlords are realizing that if they don't certify these fire escapes, the insurance companies, like you say, they don't pay the they don't pay the incident. Now your building is up for sale, and so what happens is that um, as these people, you know, go into a lawsuit, the banks don't want you know you have a mortgage on that, and the insurance is not paying anything. They just give up these buildings. So these these people that got hurt, all they have is not only the value of this person who got. 
uh, sued, but they take their building. They These people lose their building because they haven't properly maintained, as required by law, the five-year certification. So what do we have here? We have a solution that if anybody wants to take care of anything that they're doing on, their, on a building, whether it's the balconies, whether it's the railings, they can visit the Firescape Services Network, get all the information you need. It's called uh, firescapeservicesnetwork.com, or they can call you, Lance, right? Because you'll come in and you'll have, here's your phone number. But again, you're, you're, you have a great name, National Building Expert, right? But yeah. they can also visit you at your website, hawaiibuildingexpert.com. Yep, that's right. And here's your phone number. Um, so there's the two of us that can help people. Otherwise, trust your local structural engineer. Trust a local, you know, building expert to help you. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times the building official and the fire official, they don't have the information to give you because it's not hot on their uh, on their list of things to do because the uh, fire escapes are the bastard child of egress and railings and balconies have been along for how long? They've been out there for only... 50 to 75 years and no maintenance program on a lot of them. So in order for this to not happen anymore, what do we have to do? We have to conclude and train people and see if this is enough to blow the whistle and get things started and have people start a maintenance program of some kind. This is the conclusion of the seminar. Let's see if anybody has last minute questions for us and we'll gladly hold for five, 10 or 15 more minutes and answer any questions that anybody has. We just got a question for a member in the audience. Uh, who do we contact if we think the balcony is unsafe? So again, uh, all these people can call our number, um, Firescape, uh, FirescapeServicesNetwork.com. Simple number, 800-649-3333. Lance, what's your number? 808-422-2132. Uh, Almost Eight. forgot my own number. But, uh, <laughs> so well, the other also thing call... is, uh, in answer to the question, whatever the... Whoever the building manager is, if it's an apartment building, the building manager owner, if it's a hotel, contact the hotel. If it's a condo building, you contact the uh, condo board or the property manager. That's your first call to make and then see if anything. Because you're anything showing happens. that you're concerned. Right. But right. Uh, other than that, you want to get uh, go on YouTube or go on Google or go on yellowpages.com. Type in structural engineer building engineer on on uh, yellowpages.com and that's the key you need a third party examination on your fire escape don't you can't do it yourself there's no documentation that you would use to not only satisfy the city but to satisfy the insurance company that you know something you're doing something and this is what you're doing about it that puts you back under the insurance umbrella if you have a concern get it investigated because as soon as you have it investigated you're back under the insurance umbrella because now you heard something, you're doing something, and the key is that you're trying to get it dealt with and to the best of your ability within the time frame you have and within the money you have. But if anything is imminent danger or life safety, you're going to cordon those areas off. You're going to support these, these locations so that nobody's going to else. Is, what did you do to hurt, stop anybody from getting hurt? Then you have a plan. Your structural engineer, your building expert is going to come in and say, step one. Let's see if we can continue to maintain. Step two, let's see if we can reinforce what you have and buy you some time so that in the future, 5, 15, 25 years from now, you're going to replace. And in some rare cases, hey, you're in the re you're in the replacement mode now. You have to replace what you have here because there is just no. So, for example, can a hotel create a barrier system that keeps everybody away one foot from ever touching a balcony or a railing. Lance, can that, can that happen? Yeah, that, that, that can happen. It's going to take a lot of money. Instantaneously. Uh, so you still have a barrier. Now the hotel would have to go in and say, okay, how can we stop any of these pieces that may fall from hurting somebody below? That's a different process of, you know, capture or catching or whatever it may be. But 
The investigation is step one. What did I know? When did I know it? What am I doing about it? Brings insurance coverage back on. Keeping your, you know, closing your eyes, hoping for the best. Uh, what occurred here uh, is basically a canary in the coal mine. You guys have gotten a bell that rang on somebody else's property, and uh, it could happen on your property. Uh, but start the investigation process. We'd be more than happy to help you. Firescape Services Network. Dot com is our website, uh, and your website is called what? HawaiiBuildingExpert.com. There you go. We do these classes. These are free classes we'll teach. Uh, we'll have conversations with any of you, so please reach out to us. Uh, send us an email um, to, you know, uh, if you have any, any questions or concerns. Otherwise, give us a call. Again, my number is 800-649-3333. Lance, your number is what? 808-422-2132. Perfect. And Lau, let's see if there's anybody with questions. Uh, we've got quite a quite a good turnout of people. Uh, and does anybody have a question that, uh, whether it be price, whether it be repair ideas, anybody have a question for us? Because we have quite a few people out there. They're all shy. Not many people wanted to show their face. Me and Lance, we have no problem showing our face. We're old. If I see no one, okay, Lance, thank you very much for being a guest speaker. Sure, you're I welcome. I appreciate you being there. So he's on the island. I believe there's one more speaker, says iPhone uh, user. Uh, they didn't type in their yes, question. Yes, I have like a quick question. Yes. What, 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 is, what are your pricing for, like, do you do an inspection? Do you charge per room or per building, if, like, for multiple spaces? What are your price yeah. options? So the consultation is the first. So please call the numbers. We'll speak off camera with you guys and, and discuss that. But yes, it most likely will be a per unit price. And that's the only way you can do it. There's very few people that will give you a flat rate and say, this is what it is. It'll be a per unit price that you will get. And uh, volume is a, is a factor. But uh, a lot of times the initial valuation will give you the per unit price after the fact. So a lot of times the sample is what you want. You want to have take a couple of samples. You have 20, sample four or five, and that's going to give you an idea of just where you're heading with this situation. Another question that people out there, that's a great question, by the way, because everybody's concerned about cost. You know what I'm saying? And in some cases, we'll teach you how to self-inspect. So in some rare cases, you'll say, hey, your facility, I want to have my facilities guys go through and just get some things, uh, uh, you know, just under control at least. Can we do that? Yes. We can teach you how to self-inspect. Okay. Next question. Seeing none. Lance, it was a great class. I think you yeah. and I asked each other enough questions mm -hmm. and that uh, you and I uh, spoke uh, quite well, explained everything. And, uh, and if anybody wants a copy of this, we got, it got recorded. So we will send you everyone a copy of this, of this video so that you can, you share this with other staff members, please call Millie. 800-649-3333. Ask Millie for a copy of this so you can share it with owners, to, you know, Department heads, um, you want to share this with the uh, property managers, management companies, whatever. Uh, it's a free, it's, so there's no cost for us to share this information with you. Again, thank you very much. Lance, thank you very yeah. much. Aloha. Everybody thank else, you. thank you very much. There's, See you uh, next as they time. say, you're, you've, you've been made aware that the balconies and the railings in Hawaii, the paradise of the U.S., um, need attention. Thank you very much, everybody.